Despite the fact that we have conservatives controlling top offices and the House of Delegates in Virginia, will efforts to enshrine abortion in the state constitution move forward? Plus, why isn't there more outrage over Virginians being grossly overtaxed? Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. All right, well, before we get into today's topics, I thought I'd start out with something a little bit fun, and that is people that are having really bad, no good work days. And this has been in the news lately. You know, there was this Amazon driver that fell in a sinkhole that turned out to be a septic tank on his day of work. And I will say he actually went back to work, so kudos to him. (laughs) Um, Then there was this poor British Airways employee who on this person's very first day of work as an airline steward accidentally deployed the inflatable stairs. <laughs> now, I mean, this was a big deal. The flight was delayed for four hours. It costs thousands of thousands of dollars. So that would be a pretty bad first work day. So, Victoria, I was wondering, does anything come to mind where you've had a bad work day in recent memory? Well, not compared to those, I would say. <laughs> those are pretty bad. I always wondered if that any if that ever happens on an airplane, if something accidentally gets deployed. I guess I haven't read those stories, but I sort of assumed at some point someone, I thought it was a passenger, would, you know. I think I've seen some of that, too. Or some of that, something like that. But I guess on bad days, no, that really puts everything into perspective. My days are pretty darn good compared to that. I mean, I was trying to think of, you know, as you were saying that, what was my you know, worst days. I did not like the day I came in and found out that we had a pipe that leaked and went into the building next door to us. So that wasn't yeah. a good day, but I wouldn't say but compared to that. That doesn't count because that's not your fault. But I do remember one where you threw water on someone or something. Oh, right? yeah, that was a pretty bad day. That was my uh, some very early public speaking experiences where, yeah, I was shaking so hard. I sat back down at the table at a dinner and I had a senator sitting next to me and my hands were shaking and I literally picked up my water and threw it in his lap. And that was maybe not I love my that story. greatest moment. Yeah, I've <laughs> lots of not great moments so i try to block that them out though. i try to block them out like they're just gone once they're gone i just don't even yeah but other people okay. remember them <laughs> i think i would totally deploy the inflatable stairs because i do things like this on my first day um when i was a teenager and got my first job at the baskin robbins ice cream store i am this person that will conscientiously check all if the lights are out and everything when i leave so i was closing and i very carefully turned off every light switch you know, in the place. And when we came in in the next, you know, the next morning, all the ice cream was melted in the bin. Oh no, you shut off the fridge. I shut off (laughs) the the fridge display. That's a very expensive mistake. (laughs) I bet you were popular. (laughs) We served slushy ice cream all day. Oh my God. That's an expensive mistake. Like the manager was actually really sweet about it. I mean, you were a teenager. Yeah, I was 15 or something. (laughs) They got to give you good training. Training is everything. If you don't train, which light switch matters? Oh, my. Well, yeah. Nope. Can't say I've had. (laughs) Didn't do an ice cream shop. All right. Well, since we're rushing through a very quickly moving General Assembly session, I did want to start with an update. And one thing we haven't gotten to talk much about is Governor Yunkin's efforts to provide tax relief, some much needed tax relief for Virginia families. Now, he's been out there campaigning hard on this. He's, you know, this past week, he's been in restaurants, visiting with local business owners, talking about his plan. He says his core message is that our state government's huge $3.6 billion surplus points to a bigger problem with how things are handled in our state. Um, let's just listen to his comments real quick to the General Assembly about this. The writing on the wall couldn't be more simple. The people of Virginia are overtaxed, not government's money, but their money, and they are voting with their feet and their wallets. Okay, well, first of all, I just don't understand why this doesn't get more attention. If we are being overtaxed to the tune of some three billion, why aren't people shouting about this from the rooftops? Uh, Because we've been programmed into just accepting that the government takes whatever amount of money they want to take from us. We've literally been desensitized because I can't understand it, and especially where everything's so expensive right now. You'd think that being overtaxed on top of it is a problem. Yeah, because, I mean, we carefully go to the store, we ask for our rebate, we negotiate prices, and this just goes over our heads. So Yeah, I, I had somebody that used to say, if you just wrote out a check every time you pay taxes, like had to consciously and separately, okay, there's a state check, here's the federal check, mm-hmm. here's the sales tax check for the year, you'd freak out. But yeah. we do it in these little tiny increments every time we purchase something. So we just kind of, you know, get uh, lulled into it, I guess. 
Well, with his effort to try to give some of this back to the taxpayers that we overpaid, um, how is this, you know, what is the proposal here? How would it work? Yeah, so he's got a lot of different pieces, which I think is really good. Um, one, he's trying to increase the standard deduction for individuals to 9000 from 8500 and it would basically double, you know, when you're married for uh, people that filed jointly. Um, and then he's trying to cut the individual income rate from 5.75 down to 5.5. Um, and then for businesses, and people think, oh, who cares about the businesses? Well, the businesses pass it on to us. And so he's actually trying to reduce the corporate tax rate by 1% from 6% down to 5%. And that would be savings, we would assume, well, that they'd pass on to us. And that all seems like small percentages, but you think it'll add up for people? Oh, yeah, it's big money. I mean, it's definitely big money. Again, it's this whole idea of we're lulled into these little amounts, yeah. but it adds up. You buy things all the time. So, you know, your every single purchase, that corporate tax rate affects you in the consumer okay. price. Okay. All right. Well, where is this at in the legislative process, at least as we are doing this recording today? Yeah. So this is the thing. They move fast. So who knows by the time you, you hear this, you know, this could change in the next hour. But right now, his proposal has passed the House of Delegates. So it's through one major hurdle. And unfortunately, it passed exactly on party lines. I'd really like to see this be a bipartisan issue. It's very frustrating to me that that has to be Republican, Democrat. Um, so it passed 5248. I mean, just straight down the, the Republican, Democrat divide. And now it's sitting on the Senate side, that particular bill. And then there's a Senate version that is also sitting on the Senate side. So so basically, we're waiting to see what's the Senate going to do with this. Do you think uh, at least some of this could get through the Senate with maybe at least some compromise? Gosh, I'd love to see some compromise. I worry about the political dynamics out there. You know, there's this idea, oh, Governor Yunkin wants to run for president. And so the Democrats kind of have this idea, we're not going to give him anything. Uh -huh. So I worry about that being in the background of making good policy. So I'm hoping they actually just look at the proposals, recognize the surplus and say, yeah, we could definitely reduce these taxes. Yeah, that's where it's frustrating with when the politics start interfering with what's actually good for the state. Um, and you would think this would just be common sense action that politicians would feel like it would be good to support. Um, but I do think at its heart, a lot of times it reveals the differences between these big government socialistic kind of thinkers that really think we should be at the end of the day dependent on Uncle Sam for our livelihood Versus true conservatives that feel like the government should have a limited role and, and should be fostering individual responsibility, right? Well, if you think the government is the savior, then there's no amount of money that doesn't continue to make the government do good things. If you view the government as like they're the solution to all the problems and an unlimited amount of funds mm -hmm. is how you get there. And so that tends to be if you're in that mindset and liberals tend to be of that mindset, then there's no amount of money. And so it's just we keep... We want those, they want those excess taxes and they just pummel them back into programs and create more entitlements. And it's like this ever kind of cyclical, painful thing to the people that actually pay the taxes. Yeah, it, ultimately it ends up oppressing people, right? Like being burdensome. To yeah, this is the thing. It, it, you know, it, every program that might help somebody takes from somebody else. And so it, you end up just pulling down the whole process of people getting to prosperity. Mm-hmm. I wish more people understood that. Um, but I like what Delegate Joseph McNamara said. Um, he, I think he's representing Roanoke area. Um, but during a debate, he said, quote, so at what point is enough enough? At some point, if the government takes all of the money, then the very people we are trying to help are the people that are being hurt. And that's kind of what I think we were saying here. Yeah, I so appreciate that. And, and you know, we hear this all the time, especially with um, the schools is a great example. We always hear from liberals that the, the programs aren't fully funded. But they're not fully funded. Schools aren't fully funded. And the bottom line is they're never fully funded. And I, I kind of figured out how the secret sauce works on the school thing. You literally have a situation where you got schools across the Commonwealth. Somebody goes, one school says, we need an additional reading specialist. They hire an additional reading specialist on their own. Then it becomes best practice. Well, then best practice is not funded in the other 132 localities. And all of a sudden we find we're not fully funded because that one school decided to go out and say, we needed one more thing. It becomes, oh, well, that's the standard. And so there's, it's, it's an ever rising programmatic standard of how much money we need to dump into yeah. the public schools. You can't well, I mean, win. They've been saying they need more money for public schools for, what, 40, 50 years now. 
And we don't see the academic improvement it's here in Virginia, linked. especially. I, it's not linked to test scores. We're not seeing it. And there's been a fight of how much of that money is actually getting into the classroom. That's mm-hmm. a big deal. How much is actually affecting kids getting taught versus programs, buildings, whatever. So, yeah, taxes, too much. <laughs> too many taxes. All right. Well, before we get into our other topics today, I just want to give a shout out for a way that you can get involved in what's happening at the Capitol, especially if you are concerned about how all of this affects kids and parents. And that is our Parental Rights Day, otherwise known as Mama Bear Day. Uh, All concerned citizens, including Papa Bears, are welcome. But this is February 8th, Wednesday, February 8th, and things are going to kick off at the Family Foundation at 10 a.m. So go to our website. Make sure you sign up. We need you, Mama and Papa Bears and Concerned Citizens, standing behind other parents speaking out that day at a press conference on parental rights legislation moving through, which we'll be talking about in, in more detail later. Um, but also, uh, the mama and papa bears will be recognized from the house floor. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Again, just go to familyfoundation.org and check out how you can register for parental rights day, February 8th. Well, another thing that's gotten a lot of attention this past week are these efforts to change our constitution to enshrine pretty much unlimited abortion and same sex marriage. Tell us what's going on with that. Yeah. Um, So we'll start with the abortion one. There is an effort, as you say, to enshrine the right to abortion. And the way it reads is, quote, the fundamental right to reproductive freedom, which sounds so much better than saying we want a right to kill our unborn children. But the bottom line is it what it would do is create a really high bar legally for the government to ever be able to, quote, infringe upon that right. Right. So think about your right to free speech. It takes a lot for the government to be able to say, no, you don't have that right. I mean, it's it's a very high bar, and that's what they're trying to do. And so what it really means is they're trying to create a right to unlimited abortion on demand up until the point of birth, the whole nine yards, because that's really functionally what's going to happen. And even laws that we have on the books right now, so we do at least still have parental consent for abortion. Mm. Even that is a question mark. You put that right into the Constitution. Do we now lose parental consent for abortion? Because that girl has, quote, a fundamental Mm. right. Okay. Now help me understand. So we can decide in Virginia abortion is a constitutional right, even though the Supreme Court pretty much just said it isn't. Yeah. So the Supreme Court finally admitted, no, this is not in the U.S. Constitution, but it turned it back to the states. It's a state's issue now. And so, yes, a state could go either way. We'd like to see it go the other way, which is to enshrine the right to human life Mm -hmm. in the Constitution. But it can go either way. And it's what you put into your Constitution. And your Constitution is essentially your highest form of law in your state. So this really is a big deal because if this were to get through, it would pretty much um, stop any pro-life legislation trying to protect women and their babies in in its tracks before it even got anywhere, right, if this actually went through. Yeah, and if we ever got a legislature that wanted to pass human right protections, you'd end up in court immediately fighting against your state constitution. They'd all be immediately litigated. Okay, that's sobering. Yeah. Another part of this that I think people aren't thinking a lot about is that this would, if this got through, it would be done. It would be implemented at taxpayer expense. It would cost taxpayers, right? Well, I think it's very hard to claim that someone has a right to something and not end up paying for people who can't afford that right, right? So this is how we get these government programs, right? You have a right to something and then they can't afford it. And so I think it's going to end up paying for a ton of low-income abortion. So yes, it's going to become a really devastating moral thing where we sit there and go, wow, we don't agree with this and we're even funding it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the other effort to change our state constitution has to do with enshrining same-sex marriage. Tell us what's going on with that one. Yeah, it's essentially an effort to remove out of our constitution what we did enshrine, which is a traditional definition of marriage, that marriage between a man and a woman. We put that in in 2006. Um, It was overwhelmingly supported by the populace, a vote that went to the ballot because ultimately constitutional amendments get voted on by the people, not just the legislature. And what they're trying to do is actually remove that so that we can have any kind of marriage valid in Virginia. And so it's a it's a pretty major concern. And really, um, in, in, the interesting thing is people think, well, same-sex marriage is happening already because we had a Supreme Court decision in Obergefell that basically said we have to tolerate same-sex marriage in Virginia, even if our constitution, even if the people had said differently. Um, so people would go, okay, the, but then why does it, you know, why does it matter? Mm-hmm. Um, well, it matters because We, just like you saw in Dobbs, where we had a decision that said, 
oh, we're going to go back on this supposed right to abortion, there could be a time where the Supreme Court removes a Burgafell. Yeah, and they, they decided it didn't really exist. There yeah, wasn't, yeah, there wasn't really, it was not a good legal decision. And I think there could be a time where the court acknowledges that. Okay, and then so uh, we don't want to completely eliminate um, that recognition in our own state constitution. And did you... Uh, I might have missed it. Did you read the actual wording that's currently in our state constitution? If uh, you didn't, I'm going to uh, yeah, quote it real quick. No, I didn't. Okay. So what it says right now is it defines marriage as, quote, only a union between one man and one woman. And so, you know, that's why we want to preserve that language. Um, now, it's interesting. This year, they're just trying to repeal it. But last year, they actually tried to do this repeal and replace thing. Yeah, this is um, so they learned their lesson because last year they tried to repeal and put in new words. And the new words made us recognize anything, not just same sex marriage, but literally because it didn't define it as between two individuals, Mm -hmm. we might have had to recognize polygamy. And so they got a lot of heat for that. Yeah. Uh, nobody, it's a, they seem fine standing by same-sex marriage, but they seem very uncomfortable to actually defend polygamy, which I don't really, anyway, side point. But yeah. um, all that to say, they learned their lesson, and this year they're just coming in with a repeal. And I would argue, to the point, you're not even putting anything new in the Constitution. So really, the purpose of this is pretty political in my mind. I think they're mm-hmm. trying to drive out their base in an election because ultimately uh, the people will vote on this. Well, I think since we already saw what they did last year with trying to open it up to polygamy or maybe even more, you know, um, not because they just didn't specify a number, um, that kind of shows you the agenda behind this, well, and where we they want to go. And we saw that at the federal level. If folks remember the whole Disrespect for Marriage Act. I guess they call it Respect for Marriage yeah. Act. We would call it Disrespect for Marriage. But, you know, in the original version of that, there was this, okay, what are we going to do? So basically, they had to make sure there was clarity in that, that they weren't talking about polygamy because... We think yeah. that it always these things always start out very open ended, and then after a little bit of heat and pushback, then they yeah. then they go, okay, if I'm going to lose the bill altogether, I'm willing to pull back and just protect yeah. one type of marriage, which is very interesting for people who are so tolerant and open minded and think right. anything should go right up until they. Anyway, well, we need to pay attention to that because it, it pulls back the curtain from that slippery slope that is there. Um, but on another note, similar to what we saw happening in U.S. Congress, it was also disappointing at the state level to see the, the Republicans actually helping this through the process. Yeah, there does seem to be this loss of understanding that used to be much clearer in the Republican Party that the family is the nu- the nuclear family is the basis for all society, that mom, dad together in a marriage equals the best case scenario for a child in in overwhelming social science, right? So like not every case, but overwhelmingly. And that we want to build our laws around this. We want to build our society around this. And there seems to be just this live and let live thing that is coming into both political parties. And so, yeah, we saw last year when we had this vote at our state level, we had several Republicans vote in favor of the repeal and replace, the really bad version. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was a shocker. And this year we even have uh, Delegate Tim Anderson, a Republican on the House side, introducing being the sponsor mm. of the repeal. So that's that's very disappointing. It, it really illustrates that there's a loss of understanding about what really drives our society and how we're healthy. OK, first of all, what is motivating Republicans to join this? Do they not hear enough from social conservatives concerned about marriage and family? I do think that they don't, that we're, we're not speaking loudly enough, but we're also not explaining the value to a child of having a mom and a dad and how you, you know, for a long time, you'd hear these lines, what does it matter what I do in my marriage? How does that affect you, right? right. Well, that would be the big longstanding thing. And we now see very clearly how it affects us because it's affecting every person who has a faith-based view about marriage. It's affecting them in their jobs. We've talked about this so many times on this, that you can't seem to just simply live out your faith and hold to your views or you're going to be considered bigoted or whatever that might be, and it might cost you something. So we see very clearly that it's not just two people can do what they want and it has no impact. Yeah, there's real impact for kids and on the religious freedom front. Um, now, we agree with Delegate Anderson on other important things like this effort he's doing on the explicit library book issue in schools. Um, but I guess he leans more libertarian. That's the challenge is where does uh, the libertarian streak run? Because we're seeing libertarian streaks in Republicans. Now, there's a separate party for that. There's a libertarian party. Um, but because they don't tend to get elected to office, there are libertarians that end up finding themselves in the Republican Party. And then we lose some of the basic tenets of what republicanism used to stand for. 
Well, I think we really got to counter this myth that it's just a li- uh, live and let live issue with how the real impact on kids, like you were explaining, and the religious freedom impacts. Um, but with that said, help us understand the overall process here for both of these efforts to change our Constitution. Yeah, quick quick rundown on, on civics in Virginia. You've got to pass these bills twice through the legislature, so they have to go House and Senate this year. There has to be an intervening election. Then they come back, has to be the same exact wording, to what they consider a new legislature, because we've had an election. So House and Senate have to pass it again. And then it goes to the people. The governor never touches this. And this is something people forget. Governor Youngkin can't stop this. Um, so don't expect, because we have a good governor, we can all just sit back and relax and go, oh, he'll handle it. That's not the case. And so that's the process. Um, we're very concerned, of course, that these bad ideas are probably going to pass the Senate. So we're really, really working on talking to our senators to try to block it there, but also really, really working with our House members because these these bad ideas really do need to die. So I guess the main thing you need to remember is if this gets out of both chambers this time, then we need to be very concerned about next year, the same thing happening at getting through both chambers again. Um, and the earliest that you know, this could go to the people and the Constitution actually be changed would be what year? Yeah. So the election of 2024, which people need to remember is a presidential election. So Mm. we'd have people highly motivated to get legalized abortion and Mm. legalized same sex marriage coming out to the polls when we're trying to elect a good president. So Mm -hmm. just envision the political scenario. It's not a good one. Okay. All right. Well said. All right. Well, how can people help to stop this thing in its tracks right now if they want to get involved with this legislative session? Yeah, I always say the easiest way is to be on our email alert system because things move so fast and because our emails are designed to try to keep you up to speed of the moment this bill is actually in front of your legislator. So on our website at familyfoundation.org, you can sign up for our email alerts and we'll get you the information. And you just it's a one click button. Just click the button and wrote a little note and then it'll be sent off to your delegate or your senator. Now, how do they get on the text alert? Because we send out text alerts that let people actually watch the debate a lot of times. Yeah, that is also available on our website. And what a great opportunity to actually, you know, watching government can be very boring, but we don't make you watch the boring parts. We just send it out right as they're about to debate these really, really critical issues. So you get to watch the the sort of very nitty gritty fight over our values. We watch the boring parts for you. (laughs) We do. (laughs) We have a team that sits through many boring committees to make sure that you get the most exciting portion of the General Assembly. Well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! You know, in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And boy, did we see that demonstrated in a big way this past week coming from people who are opposing pro-life and parental rights bills. Yeah, the first example I I can give of this is actually Delegate Sam Razul, a Democrat representing the Roanoke area, and he had a rather inconceivable response to a proposed law that, that we've talked a lot about, and we talked about even last week, Sage's Law. Yeah, our listeners will remember us talking about this, how it's legislation named in the honor of a very courageous young teen named Sage who survived just this horrific chain of events that started with her school hiding from her parents the fact that she was experimenting with her gender at school, identifying as a male at school, using the the male bathroom that started a whole chain of bullying. But all of this culminated with her eventually uh, being sex trafficked and just going through just unspeakable trauma. Um, But the catalyst to this whole chain of of events appears to be the school employees hiding this very important information about what she was dealing with at school with her gender identity from the parents. Um, Now, you can hear her mom share that whole story during our press conference on Sage's Law, and you can find that YouTube video at familyfoundation.org. So if you want to hear the whole story, be sure to check that out. Um, But you would think, you know, with a story like this, that there would not be a lot of opposition, raging opposition to a law that is trying to make sure parents are included in these discussions at school. You would think, but no. Instead, we actually have had delegates like Sam Razul out there doing repeated interviews. I mean, not just one misstatement, but like this is the line. Let me let's, let's just play his clip. 
Talk about a nonsensical bill. I've never heard of anybody coming and complaining that they're not getting enough information about uh, this kind of subject uh, from schools. It's another divisive subject that uh, Virginians are not really concerned about. All right. You heard right there him saying you know, that this heartbreaking story is nonsensical. And I really don't know how you can listen to that and come up with that summary. Yeah, I don't know if he has his head stuck in the sand and he's just pretending to be oblivious or whatever, but it, there are parents complaining about this everywhere. There are stories like this one, maybe not as tragic as Sage's, but all over the place of 10 and 11 year olds going through gender changes at school and parents not being notified and parents are mad. You know, I had to appreciate this one dad in that New York Times article that had this quote to say, because, you know, the the New York Times interviewed a lot of left-leaning parents that felt villainized by their schools on this issue. So this dad says, quote, it's politically weird to be a very liberal Democrat and find yourself shoved in bed with, like, the governor of Texas. Am I supposed to listen to Tucker Carlson? (laughs) Yeah, I don't think he has to change his whole ideology. I mean, by all means, come on over and believe a lot more of the things that conservatives believe. But, yeah, that's that's the point. There's people from all sides concerned about this, and these delegates have to be sensitive to that. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me just real quick throw out one more contender for this week's Inconceivable Award, and that is this brand-new senator, Aaron Rouse, from the Virginia Beach area. Yeah, he he won in a special election, and um, his election was all about the abortion issue, but apparently he didn't learn how to uh, be sensitive to it. Yeah, let's just hear this quote from him real quick. I think it speaks for itself. So any legislation that attempts to put in an abortion ban um, is, is headed straight to the trash can. You know, the thing that's just really disturbing about that is that just out of a lack of awareness or blindness, he is using the word trash can in this context when we know that babies every day are just thrown in dumpsters or uh, treated as trash in this nation. Yeah, I think he is completely oblivious to how sensitive this issue to, is to a lot of people and that these are real human lives. It's, I can't believe that that's how he talks about it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, where the callousness of these statements on these different issues come from other than just kind of politics getting in the way and people just forgetting the humanity of it. Um, But I just want to wrap up and say that it's kind of hard to choose this week's Inconceivable Award. These are kind of equally outrageous. Um, But let's just give it collectively a collective Inconceivable Award to leftist leaders who are losing sight of the humanity of the issue when uh, speaking in public. And we just need people to continue telling their courageous stories, whether it's moms that have survived the abortion experience that are speaking out or people like Sage and her mom, because it's these courageous stories that are going to cut through this, cut through the society, the societal callousness, and uh, really bring back the humanity and God's mercy to this issue.